Okay, and now I'm going to go to broadcast. Are you all ready? Okay, yes. here we go. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm going to um, start in just a few minutes. I see that we have a lot of people joining. We're right now at 53, 55 participants. I think people are coming in, so we will begin in just a minute or two. One thing I want to add, um, since we are um, we are expecting quite a few people uh, in this webinar, is that if you have questions, um, we are using the Q and A function for folks um, in the audience to ask questions um, or make comments. So please use that. Um, I don't think you have a chat function, so use the Q and A. We'll give it another few minutes, but I have to say I really am enjoying looking at the list of attendees who are joining us. I know we have a lot of our UCLA alumni, um, as well as our um, current students. We have some prospective students. We have local um, attorneys, local activists, local advocates, um, and it's just an amazing list of people I see here. It makes me very sad that I can't see you all in person because it's just a really incredible um, group of people. And um, and also just as a reminder, there is a Q&A feature, not um, the chat feature where you should be using, that you should be using for questions. Um, and some of the questions right now, that yes, you should assume that you're on mute. Um, this is a webinar, which is a little different from Zoom meetings. So all of the attendees are on mute. Um, and so you do not need to worry about that. Um, and I assume that we are on mute. So yeah, great. So. Yes, all right, so we have almost 100 attendees. So again, welcome. Um, my name is Jaslyn Coley. I direct the Critical Race Studies Program here at UCLA School of Law. And welcome to our panel on the margins, social justice, COVID-19, and vulnerable communities. First, I would like to thank all of the panelists and all of the attendees for joining us here today. And before we begin, the Critical Race Studies Program and the Public Interest Program at UCLA want to acknowledge the Gabrieleno and Tonga peoples as the traditional land caretakers of the Thavangar the Los Angeles Basin and South Channel Islands. As a land-grant institution, we pay our respects to the Honukabetham ancestors, Ahihiro elders, and Yohinkam, our relatives, relations, past, present, and emerging. And I'd like to add that while it is always important to acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of indigenous peoples, it seems particularly important to reflect right now on our history of violence and colonialism and the linkages of disease and genocide in our country. COVID-19 is a deadly disease, but the destruction to our communities is not caused solely by the virus itself. We've heard everyone from politicians to celebrities espouse that the coronavirus does not discriminate, 
It's colorblind. It knows no class. Rich and poor are both at risk. It's a great equalizer. We are all sheltering in place alone but together, even if some of those places are a bit more luxurious and comfortable than others. And while it might be technically true that the disease itself does not discriminate, discriminate the same cannot be said for our society, our history, and our infrastructures. COVID-19 has very explicitly laid bare and also exacerbated our already existing inequities. It is tragically clear that the most devastating effects of this crisis will be felt by the most vulnerable amongst us. We see the dramatically disproportionate rates at which Black and Latinx peoples are dying from the virus. And we know all the ways in which a history of racism has contributed to these deaths, not quote unquote individual choices as our Surgeon General opines. We see the violence and the hate crimes inflicted on our API communities, including right here at UCLA Law. We see the ways in which service sector workers who have long fought for living wages and safe working conditions are now praised for being heroic and essential, when in fact they're called upon to be martyrs for a capitalist system that has always treated them as dispensable. We've seen the cruel conditions in prisons and immigra immigration detention facilities become even crueler. And we ask people to shelter at home for their safety and for ours when so many amongst us are unhoused or are less than a paycheck away from losing the housing that they do have. And in this crisis, our usual ways of responding, of advocating, of organizing, of collective action and protest are impeded by these physical distancing measures. So we are so lucky that we have with us here today some incredible advocates who under these extraordinary and challenging and difficult conditions are, fight are fighting against the ways this global pandemic has affected some of our most vulnerable communities. And we so appreciate your time and really look forward to hearing from them and from all of you. And I'll turn it over to um, my co-moderator and um, co-organizer, um, Karen Wang. Thank you, Jesseline. Um Thank you for both doing the land acknowledgement and for your comments. And I actually, we didn't coordinate well enough my comments. So basically I'm at risk of echoing a lot of what she said. So I'll, I'll keep mine shorter. Um, I do want to say welcome on behalf of um, not just CRS, but the David J. Epstein program um, on public interest law and policy at UCLA Law. Um, I am the executive director of the program, but I also want to thank um, two of our team members who are running technical support behind the scenes, Brenda Kim and Jamie Libinate. So thank you to both of them um, for their support in making this happen today, as well as to our speakers and to all of you. You. Um, I am really excited to hear from the speakers um, and the great work they're doing. Um, we actually had a hard time, Jasmine and I, paring down the issues because there are so many social justice issues that are um, really being um, uh, impacted right now uh, during this whole COVID-19 um, global health crisis, as well as all the economic and social consequences that have flowed from that. Um, we're excited that this topic has generated so much interest from the community, from all of you. Um, and we welcome those of you from UCLA Law and outside of UCLA who've joined us today. Um, my, the only other thing I want to say is uh, this past month has been really surreal um, for those of us who, um, I think including many of us on this call, who've had the privilege to be able to be safer at home, to work remotely, to go to school remotely. Um, and so a lot of what we're examining today are issues that may affect our families and our friends, um, um, some of our colleagues, um, but for many of us, we are in a place where um, the real um, damage from the COVID-19 pandemic is not as um, acute as it is for those that we're going to talk about today. Um, and as Jasmine mentioned, the kind of significant in inequities that have long existed have really been um, exacerbated. And so today we're going to tackle four, um, four issues, but not the only four, but four that we thought were particularly meaningful to um, the population um, that we were aiming at with this webinar. So um, many of the students that come here and, and end up in the CRS and and Pilfer Epstein programs at UCLA. And honestly, a lot of people go to law school or teach in law schools are moved by issues around criminal justice, um, issues around workers' rights, issues around housing and other poverty issues, um, as well as issues around immigration and detention. And so these are the ones that we decided to tackle today because we know um, for our students, for our community, many of us are trying to figure out um, what exactly does COVID-19 mean for these issues that were so um, 
in many cases, tragic and difficult to begin with. And what does this pandemic mean in terms of how things have gotten worse? Um, we also hope to tackle um, through the speaker's comments uh, ways in which um, all of us as more privileged members with education and health privileges for many of us to be able to step in and help um, to the extent that we can. So we don't have all the answers today, but we are really grateful um, for our four speakers um, who've agreed to take out more than an hour uh, of their day, which I think is a big sacrifice because you're all in the middle of dealing with some of the worst COVID-19 crisis issues. Um, and so we thank you for coming to share with us what's happening on the ground and um, hopefully uh, letting us know how we might join in the fight for greater equity uh, during this moment. Um, with that, I think we're going to, we'll, we'll, we'll run through a quick uh, introduction of our four panelists and then turn to the first two questions that we have for them. Um, I'll turn it back to Jasleen. Great. So we have with us today Rachel Torres. Rachel is the Deputy Political and Civil Rights Director for the United Food and Commercial Workers, UFCW, Local 770, where she leads the Fair Work Week campaign for retail workers to have more control over their work schedules and lives. She has more than a decade of experience working on issues affecting working people and is currently involved in one of the most high-profile COVID-19 workers' rights fights as part of UFCW, which is fighting amidst a global pandemic to protect the health and safety of grocery, pharmacy, and food delivery drivers as essential workers. And I was also incredibly lucky to have Rachel Torres as a colleague when we were both at Unite Here Local 11, the Hotel and Restaurant Workers Union. Uh, we also have with us Nisha Vyas. Uh, Nisha is a 2003 Critical Race Studies and Public Interest Program alum who is currently a senior housing attorney with the Western Center on Law and Poverty, an advocacy and litiga litigation organization focused on housing, healthcare, and safety net programs for low-income Californians. Previously, she directed Public Council's Homelessness Prevention Law Project and she has also worked for the Southern California Housing Rights Center and Stanford Community Law Clinic. Nisha's work is rooted in the belief that all persons should have access to safe and affordable housing of their choice. And this has put her at the center of the Los Angeles right to counsel movement, as well as the struggle to protect tenants during the COVID-19 crisis. And I'll turn it over to Karen to introduce our last two panelists. Um, also with us today um, is uh, Professor Sharon Dolovich, uh, one of um, Jasleen and my colleagues from UCLA Law, where she directs the UCLA Law Prison Law and Policy Program. Um, she also teaches courses on criminal law, constitutional law, prisons, and other post-conviction topics. Her scholarship focuses on law, policy, and theory of prisons and punishment, and she's she has advised on institutional prison reform as well as on many individual prisoners' rights cases. Um, in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, she launched and now spearheads um, UCLA's COVID-19 Behind Bars Data Project, um, which you should have gotten as a link in the reference materials that were sent out before the call today. Um, the, the data project is an open source database to track coronavirus-driven policy changes and court orders impacting prisons and jails across the country. And the project's primary aim is to assist those advocates and state officials pushing for decarceration in the face of this unprecedented public health crisis. And she's also become quite adept at Zoom teaching, as you'll see, because I think she's the only one of us that has, that has a PowerPoint. <laughs> um, last but not least uh, is another alum, Carlin Kerchetti, who is a 2016 UCLA um, Epstein program and CRS alum. Um, she is currently the supervisory attorney of the Los Angeles office of El Ultralado, which represents clients on a range of immigration issues, including detained immigrants, as well as immigrant, uh, as well as, I'm sorry, asylum seekers at the U.S.-Mexico border. Before El Otrolado, she was a staff attorney at Caresen, which is the Central American Resource Center in LA. And before law school, she actually was a bilingual teacher and professor of um, ESL, or English as a Second Language, in Chicago. And if you're on social media, you may have seen a recent post from Carlin about the daunting work of visiting her clients at Adelanto Detention Center uh, in an effort to secure their health and safety during the COVID-19 pandemic, something I'm sure she'll touch on today. Um, so those are our really wonderful um, four uh, speakers. Thank you again for joining us. Um, we're going to jump into the first question, and we're going to ask each of them to take this one, um, one by one. Um, and I'll, I'll show the order, um, but I'll ask the question first. And the question is, how has the pandemic affected the work of your organization and the communities with which uh, you work? And um, what are the challenges you're facing, and how are you responding? And let's go in the order of Sharon, followed by Nisha, Rachel, and then Carlin. So Sharon, to you. So um, thank you to Karen and Jasleen for organizing this and for inviting me to participate. And thanks to all of you for taking the time out of your day to be here, at least virtually. 
Um, as uh, Karen said, I teach here at UCLA on the faculty. My focus is um, prisons and prison law. And um, I direct the Prison Law and Policy Program. And I also just in the last month have launched um, and I'm working with an amazing team here at UCLA on our uh, COVID-19 Behind Bars Data Project. So I'm gonna talk to you about the situation in prisons and jails during this pandemic and what's been happening on the ground in response. And then I'll um, hopefully describe to you the work that we are doing uh, with the data project. So as some of you may already know, conditions inside prisons and jails around the country are almost designed to facilitate the rapid spread of the virus. Um, when you are in crowded prisons, you can't socially distance. It's also hard uh, for people even just to keep their hands clean. You know, people lack basic uh, access to basics like soap and uh, hand sanitizer and clean towels and warm water, the things that many people uh, are lucky to take for granted. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the conditions, but as, as uh, Karen said, I wanna just share with you um, some photographs because you know it'll give you I think a better feel than I could um, uh, just tell you in describing it. Um, and these are these are photographs taken by lawyers from the prison law office who are representing uh, California prisoners in a class action called uh, Plata, uh, which deals with medical care in the California prison system. They've been doing that for years, and these are some of the more recent photos they've taken. And I'm just going to scroll through them so you can get a feel for this is a dormitory where people have desks and beds kind of crammed together you know so it's very hard to keep separate even you can't possibly socially distance even if you're just going along the pathway here these are some of the um, bathrooms at CIM uh, supposed to have been sinks over here but they were torn down long ago and not replaced and this is a bathroom shared by you know an entire dormitory of 80 people just more pictures just to give you a feel for the crowd. And you know, here's somebody in a wheelchair. Sharon, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think that um, the pictures aren't scrolling. If you, um, I think if you start the slideshow from the beginning, I think that we're not able to see the pictures themselves. We're just seeing the, the first page of oh, the. All right, let me get, oh, I see, my apologies. So I think I'll have to do it this way. Thank you for telling me that. Um, no, not at all, thank you. I'll do it this way. Can you see them now? Is that the first picture? Yeah, that's the first picture. Well, I'll do it. You'll see them smaller, but you'll just, I'll just go through them quickly. This is the bathroom I was just oh. describing uh, for you know, 80 people share. These are the sinks for uh, 80 people, three working sinks you'll see. Again, just more crowding, just to give you a feel for you. Know, these are, some of these are units that have people, this is someone in a wheelchair. I was just saying, very hard to socially distance. You know, these, these bunk beds are two feet apart. And so you're just a few feet above one person and then two feet next to people on either side. Um, more pictures of dormitories. Uh, this, is a, this is a unit uh, in the medical facility that 20 people live in. They share one bathroom. Uh, more pictures of that unit. Um, and this is uh, one of the dorms at Corcoran. And the way the housing goes is people are kind of, the bunk beds are jammed in these small spaces and then they share the day room. Again, really hard to socially distance. Uh, this is the only picture they had from a dorm in the women's facility at CCWF. Uh, but you just, you basically, I mean, this is just to give you a feel for uh, what the conditions look like. So basically, the big problems in California prisons and prisons and jails all over the country, overcrowding, understaffing, which is especially going to be an issue when staff start getting sick, as they already have, and, you know, stop coming to work. Um, there's lack of basic sanitation and hygiene. Um, and another feature of life in prison is that people age much more quickly which means that uh, you know, people who are 50 probably have the physical um, health of someone who's sort of 60 or 65 um, uh, because prison healthcare is so grossly inadequate, uh, which means that you have a huge number of people who are high risk. In California alone, the prisons alone, we have 17,000 people who are in high risk categories because they are elderly and or medically compromised, which just gives you a feel for um, kind of the conditions that people are uh, living and working in. And I would say that these conditions um, were unconstitutional even before COVID-19, but now they are potentially um, catastrophic uh, because of course the, the virus is inside and people are starting to get it and people are starting to die. Um, I'll just say um, just a little bit about the advocacy, um, the main focus for advocacy. Some people are working on trying to improve conditions for people inside, of course, but the main focus of advocacy has been on efforts to decarcerate. The idea is you get enough people out of these facilities to allow reduced density, so making social distancing possible to the extent it is possible. Um, there has been some movement on releases. Advocates have been pushing both at the county level uh, to release people from jails and at the state level to get people released from prisons. Um, 
there's been a little more success on the jail side than the prison side because there are more vectors for possible releases. Um, so sheriffs and judges, in, uh, state judges have been uh, releasing people who are in jail for low level misdemeanors or parole violations or who are there on money bail but couldn't afford to pay the bail. Uh, the problem, or the problem, the fact is that many jurisdictions have already started to deal with that low hanging fruit and the facilities are still crowded. And um, so, which explains why there hasn't been more, um, we haven't seen bigger releases in the, on the jail side. On the prison side, there's even fewer levers to pull. Um, people are working on speeding up parole releases on the back end, maybe some compassionate release, although it's a very onerous procedural process to get out on compassionate release. Um, so the prisons in particular, we have not seen much movement on uh, the prison side. And I would just, I just wanted to highlight a few sort of themes or features of the carceral landscape in the United States um, that, has been, that have been in place for several decades now that I think are making it so that the law and the policy um, are so uh, difficult to overcome for advocates who are trying to get people released. And the three themes are secrecy, deference, and what I think of as the kind of ideological overlay of tough on crime. So for decades, prison officials have been used to being able to operate in secret. It's hard to get media inside facilities. It's hard to get um, uh, family members, uh, members of the public to see what's going on, which of course makes it very hard now to get the information we need. Um, courts and legislators have shown much deference and discretion to prison officials, so they are used to running their own show and have created legal regimes that make it hard for outside interference, and by interference I mean advocacy to shift away from mass incarceration. And through all of this, we have this ideological overlay of tough on crime, by which I mean a kind of training of the public to resist releasing people, resisting seeing people in prison as human beings who, whose health and safety should matter. Uh, and I think what we're seeing now that the virus is in the prisons and the infection is starting to spread and people are starting to die is that those three dynamics of secrecy, deference, and uh, kind of hostility um, to a sense of people's humanity inside are making it difficult to really make the changes that we need to see. So I'll leave it there when we come back. When I come back, I'll talk to you more about the, uh, about the database. Great. Nisha? Hi, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to be with everyone today and to be among um, uh, advocates who are doing really incredible work, um, both on this panel and the folks who have joined. Um, as, uh, as Jasmine mentioned, uh, I'm a senior attorney with the Western Center on Law and Poverty, and we advocate in, in three areas, um, public benefits and economic justice, health and housing. And I'm on the housing team, so I'll concentrate on that in our discussion today. But we do have a COVID-related page um, on our website that's frequently updated with resources as they are becoming available um, that were prepared by um, Western Center and its partners. Um, statewide and so for more information on the important work that all of our teams are doing um, I do encourage you to visit our website. So there's three points that I kind of want to make um, in the time that we have together. Um, first is that this and in, in both Jasleen and Karen um, and Sharon have touched on this is that the crisis um, has uh, the, the, the crisis has been going on for far longer than the pandemic. So Low income clients of, of low income clients and, and um, people experiencing poverty, including community in communities of color, have been in crisis for um, a number of years. Um, and during the state of emergency, we really need to push our gov for governmental responses that are tailored to protecting these communities, um, including maintaining and even expanding benefits programs and stopping displacement. And third, I want to pose a question, which is thinking about how do we use this as an opportunity to affirmatively, affirmatively make fundamental changes to, to our society. So going back to the first point of the, the crisis um, having been in place much longer than the pandemic, um, our safety nets have been unraveling for years, um, including most dramatically during the recession and its aftermath, and now during this Trump era that we're living through. Um, we have had significant legislative and administrative um, advances in California in recent years on behalf of the clients and communities that we serve. Um, 
but the evidence of our overlapping affordable housing crisis and our homelessness crisis are apparent. Um, you know, just you can see it directly outside of our windows, right? Um, and then on top of that, our, our eviction process, the process by which our, our um, landlords recover property from tenants has always was created in order to, for that to happen. And it's always been stacked against tenants um, prior to the, um, you know, prior to the pandemic, it was, it's, uh, the, this, this process has long been in place and um, has been a tool for displacement. And we really have to think about now when we're being ordered to stay in place and ordered for our health and safety to stay in place and ordered for the health and safety of our communities to stay in place what it means for people to do, be, uh, be at risk of displacement at this time. Um, so without the advocacy um, on these issues at this time during the pandemic to prevent displacement, um, it wouldn't happen on its own, right? So um, housing advocates throughout the state have mobilized locally and statewide to try to get the tenant protections in place um, through advocacy with local governments and statewide. Um, we, we really advocated for a meaningful statewide eviction moratorium so we can prevent the displacement this time. And um, we, dirt through March, um, we worked really, along with our partners, worked really hard to be able to try to get something in place so that we would not see displacement occurring what we projected to be at the time that California was at its peak in terms of hospital resources and emergency resources um, and COVID deaths. Um, we saw April 1st coming very quickly, that being the, the first of the month being the date that most people pay the rent and seeing that the folks that we had already been working with prior to the pandemic who were at the precipice um, were at risk of, of losing their homes and that people now who are newly experiencing poverty who had lost income um, would also be at risk of losing their homes. So um, it, the statewide advocacy went on th throughout the, the month of March and, and still continues. Um, we had uh, the governor issue two, uh, we saw the governor issue two mor moratoriums addressing, uh, excuse me, two executive orders addressing evictions, um, the second of which was an, um, called an eviction moratorium and provided some protections, um, but we um, and our, our statewide partners found that to be um, not quite all the way there, and, but at the same time the governor did issue, a third, did issue a third executive order that granted the Judicial Council, uh, which is the body that makes policy for the 58th um, Court, the 58 court systems throughout the state to be able to provide um, emergency orders. And one of those emergency orders that was adopted on April 6 was um, an order uh, that the courts would not issue summons in evictions cases, nor would they issue defaults or default judgments, which are often the quickest way in which um, tenants end up receiving sheriff's lockout notices. At the same time, um, we and our partners, including the ACLU, have been advocating with the 58 different sheriff's offices throughout the state to actually stop enforcing um, writs of possession. So meaning like to stop enforcing lockout orders. Um, and so that has been ongoing. Many counties have actually committed to stop enforcing those orders, except where they um, have to, they implicate health and safety. Um, but we have, uh, you know, there's still several that are continuing to do lockouts. So this advocacy is incredibly important to make sure that people are not displaced at this time and to give an opportunity for us to be able to fashion more solutions. So it brings me to my third question, um, my third point, which is really a question, is how do we use this opportunity to remake our society? Um, a colleague the other day mentioned this, I'm going to borrow it, um, the, the Indian author uh, Arundhati Roy recently published an article called The Pandemic as a Portal. And in it, she poses the question, do we at the end of this, and there's, hopefully there's an end to this, 
that do we go back to the way things were or do we try to use this opportunity to forge a new path and one that involves justice and liberation for our communities and ensuring that people are able to live with dignity. And so I'll kind of leave it at that and happy to delve into more details um, during the Q&A. Thank you, Nisha. Let's go to Rachel. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be with all of you. Um, I know there's a bunch of folks that we can't see that are uh, in our universe. It's really wonderful uh, to be with everybody today. Um, yeah, so it's been a whirlwind of a month. <laughs> um, if, I, if I look back, I'm like, oh my god, I think it was March 10th when, uh, when we started having these conversations. Um, so, you know, I would say uh, in, in, it's interesting because in fact, we were not positioned at all <laughs> for this uh, for this situation. Um, you know, 2020 was supposed to be the year of um, getting rid of Trump. It was supposed to be about building up our membership to go into other states um, to you know um, support folks on the ground um, in the swing states, um, and it was about passing policy for retail workers around um, as what as Lee mentioned, our Fair Work Week policy. So all of that came to a very, very um, abrupt halt um, at around, you know, the first, second week of March, where it was becoming clear um, that grocery stores were going to be a place that was going to remain open, um, unlike a lot of places that have been shut down, folks have been laid off, um, folks are talking about unemployment and disability, um, all of a sudden grocery and retail became um, a location of the pandemic. Um, both for panic shopping and also um, the spread of the of the disease, um, and so you know it's it's been a heck of a heck of a time for us. Um, you know, I, I share this as sort of an analogy that um, grocery workers are not like um, police officers, firefighters, nurses. They're not used to every day being a crisis. You know, they. Um, they, they talk about what's happening in grocery right now as like every day being um, the day before Thanksgiving, you know, where you're just seeing this level of panic and crowds and, um, you know, grocery workers have, have had um, anxiety attacks on the job. They've just literally done walkouts, um, you know, both union and non-union. Um, and, um, and so I would say it's sort of, in many respects, sort of the best of times and the worst of times, because it's it's brought into laser focus, which uh, what grocery workers do, and you know I, I I think that the level of support on social media has been extraordinary. Um, I actually love the term essential because it really sort of cuts through the quick of um, of what we're talking about, um, and it raises all of the things that I think we in the labor movement and the broader social justice movement have been saying for a very long time, which is these are the people who put food on your table, and yet you, you think of them as less than human. You don't pay them a living wage, you don't provide access to health care, um, you don't even call them an employee, right, in, in terms of for, for food delivery drivers. Historically, they've been considered independent contractors with no rights or benefits, that they are merely an app right, that they're not even people. So, you know, in some respects, this, the, the pandemic has sort of lifted the rock off of uh, what it means to be a grocery worker. And I, and I really truly appreciate the, the response that people have had. Um, you know, the term heroic is interesting. I think grocery workers know that what they're doing is, is vitally important to keep society booming and keep society moving. At the same time, you know, terms like essential and heroic are only meaningful if they come with rights and protections and benefits. Um, when this pandemic first hit and we sort of recognized that we were sort of uniquely positioned to respond to some of the, the needs and concerns of what was happening, you know, we, <laughs> we on the left, we got so excited and it was like, oh my God, this is gonna be, you know, disaster socialism and we're gonna get this thing and that thing and this thing and, you know, it's just gonna be, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. And I think we all had to kind of take a moment, take a breath and say, wait a second, we're being fought on the right of grocery workers to have access to wash their hands. We're being pushed back on the right of retail workers um, to take time off if they're sick. 
oh, we uh, as grocery workers don't even have access to testing, even though we are um, being impacted in, a, in the most immediate way, in the same ways that nurses and doctors are. So it was a real big realization very quickly that if we were going to do anything to be successful, it was like every social movement. It had to be through incremental change, but it had to be through consistent pushing and it had to be comprehensive. So um, in our political civil rights department, we basically said city, county, state, that we are, gonna, we are going to move every policy we can think of at LA City, at LA County, and the state of California, and that hopefully through all the things we do, through workers sharing their stories, through direct action, through press, through policy, through community engagement, that we would move the ball forward. And I think, you know, in less than a month, we've been pretty successful. Um, we have implemented a policy at LA City to protect um, grocery workers who, believe it or not, I mean, I, we're, this is a circle of friends, so I'm sure you will believe what I tell you, uh, that even in this situation, well, especially in this situation, what, what grocery stores wanna do is they wanna hire a bunch of non-union workers and they want to only give people a certain amount of hours. Um, so even just getting access to the additional hours that are being provided, because as folks probably would, would guess, um, grocery workers don't um, have access to a full-time schedule. Um, full-time means you have access to benefits, means access to pr other protections. So before we can even get to this argument of around being treated fairly, the first step was to get access to hours. The second was to get access to protection of your schedule because um, as we all know, once the schools um, became virtual um, and grocery workers were being asked to work longer hours, who was taking care of their kids or who was giving them the, um, the opportunities of, of giving them the education during this time. So just the simplest pieces around scheduling and hours was, was fundamental and crucial. So we got that at the city level. The mayor stepped in at a very critical moment and, and um, executed an executive order, which uh, allowed for the hand washing, um, allowed for crowd control, and then pushed for uh, PPE, per, uh, personal protective equipment, face masks, um, face covering, so that grocery workers would have that protection. Then we went to the county and last and yesterday passed a, a policy for um, delivery workers so that they are currently considered employees under the law and have all the rights and protections of an employee while at the same time having a protection of a no contact delivery, um, of having, um, uh, what else did we get? Oh, access to restrooms, because if, uh, believe it or not, when they go in to pick up your food, they oftentimes can't wash their hands to pick it up. So they become another vehicle for the, the pandemic to spread. And what I think, and just to sort of like, kind of take it from the 30,000 feet, um, these are policies that historically would have taken us two years to pass, right? We had to do it within a three week time period. And three, four weeks ago, these seemed like radical asks. Now they're, they become the norm. Um, and so the, the next step, the next level is, as we all know, is enforcement, right? There's law in the books versus law in action. We can have all the most beautiful laws written down if people don't know them, they don't understand them, they can't enforce them, it doesn't quite matter. And what we're seeing, and I think this, this panel is the perfect kind of vehicle to discuss it, is we're seeing enforcement happening in totally different ways. So on the west side, in higher end stores, enforcement is super strong. Workers have access to protective gear, customers come in with protective gear, um, there's um, adherence to social distancing. In locations like in South LA, none of this is occurring. So, you know, race and gender are always factors in all of this. And I think for us, the next level is to work with all of you, work with the community to make sure that enforcement occurs because without that, all of this work doesn't quite mean anything. So I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Rachel. And then last but not least, um, Carlin. Hi everyone, thank you so much to uh, Philip and CRS for having me here on the panel today to talk about our work. Uh, it was a pleasure to be here on the panel and I know that all of you are taking time out of your day. There's a lot of really 
inspiring advocates here on the panel and listening. So thank you for taking that time. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our work generally and how it's changed since the pandemic's begun, and then more specifically about uh, my work um, representing immigrants in detention in particular in the Adelanto Detention Center. So our organization is a binational organization. We have offices in Tijuana, San Diego, and Los Angeles. And in our Tijuana office, we help uh, immigrants who are currently in the MPP or Remain in Mexico program. That program um, is essentially on pause right now. So everyone who would have had a court hearing, the hearings are going to be rescheduled and the immigrants themselves are living basically in limbo at the border, oftentimes in refugee camps without access to um, sufficient shelter, medical supplies, things like that we would normally need in this kind of pandemic, you know, hand sanitizer, soap, running water, things like of that nature. So one of the things our office has done, um, we've kind of shifted right now from just immigration services to really helping people try to survive. And I know that sounds very uh, drastic, but it's, it's the truth. Um, we started a migrant humanitarian fund to help buy supplies for immigrants who are stuck at the border. And from that, we've been able to purchase some basic necessities. And we've even been able to donate some medical supplies, including oxygen tanks and oxygen concentrators for medical facilities in Tijuana. Um, in the LA community, we do a lot of work in the LA immigrant community as well. One of our initiatives here is a project sewing masks. So we have a project is called uh, Homework for Health. And through that project, we're actually selling masks and people can go online and donate masks to those in need. So far, we've provided masks to clients experiencing homelessness. We've provided uh, masks as well to medical workers and to other attorneys who have to visit the detention center. So um, turning specifically to the detention center, that's uh, what I've been working on during these past few weeks, which I uh, feel like basically years at this point. Um, to for, The situation is constantly evolving. So as was previously mentioned, in, detention centers are basically like prisons. So if you think of conditions in a prison, that's pretty similar in a detention center. There's no ability to socially distance. Clients sleep uh, in, in cells where they are basically about two to three feet apart from each other at all times. They live in dormitories with up to 100 people. There's shared surfaces in restrooms that they all have to share. They have to share the same phones in the dormitory to make phone calls. They have to share a water cooler. And the detainees themselves are responsible for cleaning all of these surfaces. When they actually clean, they don't have masks. They sometimes have, oh, pardon me, they sometimes have gloves or things like that, but they don't always consistently have gloves either. And so it's really um, a difficult and dangerous circumstance for them to be in. At the same time, there's really no information being provided to detainees about COVID-19 and about the risks. We've talked with numerous clients about that. They've essentially learned of the risks by watching the news. So they're in this environment where they can clearly see that they're not able to take the precautions that they need to take. And they're basically afraid constantly because having that awareness, if you could all imagine what it would feel like knowing what you should be doing to keep yourself safe during the pandemic, but yet being crowded into a cell with a hundred other people, sharing things with them, not having access to masks, seeing people around you become sick, those are the kind of conditions that our clients are experiencing regularly. Uh, we personally as an office have shifted our work substantially to focus on getting as many people to safety as possible. So that means pursuing various avenues, including parole requests, bond hearings. And uh, we've also begun a habeas project as well in Los Angeles, which is entirely new for us. Um, until two weeks ago, I had not worked on a habeas. I had not worked on a TRO. And now that's essentially the bulk of my work at this point. So previously when we were representing clients, we would anticipate representing them through the duration of their case, often in detention because Adelanto is notorious at this point for extremely high bonds and parole denials. So basically the only way for people to get out of Adelanto safely before was to complete their case. Right now, because of the urgency of the situation, we actually have had to go and take the step of, of pursuing other relief through federal court. And that work is being done as well by, um, and by colleagues at several nonprofits in Los Angeles and by the Federal Public Defender's Office. So it's become a very urgent situation. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been working with clients in particular who have serious health issues. Uh, clients who suffered, one client had a heart attack. We have client who has HIV. We have clients who have autoimmune diseases. It's a very dire situation. Clients who have asthma, 
and we're just trying to help as many as we can as quickly as possible. But that being said, it is a new um, it is a new area of law for myself and for my colleagues in the Los Angeles office. And as we're doing these declarations and meeting with clients, uh, I, I believe some of you may have seen uh, on our El Otro Lado page we shared. Uh, it's a photo of me at the detention center with uh, the protective wear. The situation now is that in order to go in and see clients, we have to provide our own PPE. Uh, we obviously don't have access to those materials and it also presents a, even an ethical dilemma for us because really those materials should be left, like N95 masks should be left for doctors, but we're required to come to the facility now with an N95 mask. We previously would go in with masks that, um, that our director, Nora Phillips, actually made for us through her mask project, but now we've been told we need an N95. We have to have gloves, we have to have goggles, but yet when we arrive at the facility, the guards are coming and going without any type of protective where our clients still tell us that guards are entering into the cell area with no masks. And so really, the, there's just no, there's no safety for the clients. It's, it's really not a situation of if, it's a situation of when. We've already seen uh, 12 COVID-19 cases at the Otay Mesa Detention Center in San Diego. And the response there has just been horrific, um, attempting to obligate people to sign uh, that they won't hold co they won't hold core civic liable in the event that they get sick um, pepper spraying people due to their reaction um, and their questions about COVID-19 it's been uh, it's just been really a very difficult time so I do think though that this does present an opportunity for all of us uh, to really ask as a, as a country about what we want to do in terms of detaining immigrants, and if this is the time to end, well, obviously I think it is, mass incarceration of civil detainees by ICE. And I believe that's my time, so I'll stop there and I can answer any more questions later. So thank you to all of you um, for, um, for those really, really um, illuminating um, um, presentations. Uh, I wanted to read some of the questions that have come in because I think they all, center around um, a similar theme, which is that we have over 130 people who are on this call, many of them advocates, um, committed activists, um, really engaged community members, and um, we're hearing from a lot of people wanting to know how they can get involved. So I'll read a couple of the questions that we've received. Um, from Susan Flores, we received the question, um, this question is for everyone, what can we do now and after the crisis to help and stand with imprisoned, jailed people, essential workers, immigrants, and tenants, not only as individuals, but as CBOs and advocacy groups that may not engage in that work specifically. Um, Nisha asks, are there pro bono opportunities available to support you? How can attorneys support your work on a pro bono basis? Um, and um, in chat, I think we have um, from Victor Naro a similar question. Um, Thank you all for your awesome presentation and great work in the trenches to bring justice to the lives of others in the midst of this deep crisis. My question is focused on post-COVID-19 crisis. We will be walking out into a different world once the crisis is behind us. What do you see as opportunities for all of us to work together to create a new society that will advance justice in people's lives? So I know these are really big questions, which I think all of us could spend an entire um, panel, an entire, entire workshop um, discussing. But if we can maybe limit your answers to about two to three minutes um, with some next steps and ways for people to get involved. And also um, noting that we will send a follow up to all of our attendees with some links and other um, information regarding how to get involved as well. So Carlin, can we start with you? Sure, um, I think a very important thing that everyone can do regardless of whether you're an attorney, a law student, um, or if you're not in the legal profession would be to call your representatives. Right now, um, you, an easy message would be to support the FIRST Act, and that is the Freedom for Immigrants, um, but no, Federal Immigrant Release Safety and Security Togetherness Act that was just introduced that would release some of the most vulnerable detainees. Um, I would also encourage if people feel so moved to simply call and say to release all ICE detainees um, during this pandemic and always. I think that would be very, it's very helpful and that's some kind of basic advocacy that we can all do. It really only takes a couple minutes. Beyond that, as far as pro bono opportunities, we do have a wait list of people who uh, would be eligible for a habeas petition. And so if any attorneys do feel that they could take on a habeas case on a pro bono basis, we would certainly 
a welcome hearing from them, and that would be something that could really be done to support. For law student volunteers, we do have opportunities for remote declarations and for parole packets that law students could also help with. And I think as far as the question, the bigger question of what, what would be the next steps coming out of this pandemic, um, as I said, I really think this is illuminating the inequities. It's illuminating an already broken system. And I think that all of us should come together when we're looking in terms of immigration detention to really call for an end to immigration detention, a reform to our immigration system so that it is just and respects human rights because we do not have a system right now that respects human rights. Thank you so much. Um, I think next, if we can hear from Nisha. Sure. I guess my initial thought is that, you know, these issues aren't actually distinct, that they are overlapping and people experience multiple issues at the same time. A family um, with, uh, you know, may have, you know, someone who is seeking basic labor protections um, and has family members who are incarcerated or in, um, in, in detention um, um, and still have to pay the rent. So, I mean, this, the, all of our issues are overlapping and interconnected. And I really think that, you know, without stating an answer here is that I think our, our, we all have to come together and sort of use this opportunity to, to advance, um, advance all of these issues on behalf of the clients and communities we serve. Um, in all of the forums that are available to us. And um, I really like what Carolyn said about civic engagement. Um, it's as simple as individually being able to pick up the phone and um, well, one, connect with these issues and then pick up the phone and be able to contact representatives about, the, about these issues. And then just also just get involved in the existing coalitions and um, in, in issues that uh, if, your, if your organization is working on a particular issue, um, uh, then, you know, reach out to other local coalitions to find out what other opportunities there are that also impact the, the clients and communities you serve and how, how, how we can all work together. I think it's a time to think expansively. Um, in terms of how people can get involved, I, you know, yes, yeah, certainly uh, we're always looking for pro bono, uh, you know, attorneys to come in um, and partners to come in and do, and help us with uh, impact work and with um, advocacy uh, and also on behalf of our local partners who may be looking for pro bonos to get involved on cases involving um, towing or ticketing or eviction defense. Um, so I think that there's, there's just plenty of opportunities out there. I think we just have to reach out and ask. Thank you. Um, and maybe we can turn it um, over to Rachel now. Sure. Um, so yeah, I 100% I, I agree. I think all of the advocacy that folks are doing work in tandem really well. And it's the same communities impacted. It's the same communities that are pushed to work during this pandemic that um, have family members that are incarcerated, that are having um, housing issues. So um, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, in the most basic form, um, this may seem incredibly remedial to say, but being a good citizen in the grocery store makes a big difference. Um, wearing your protective gear, um, being respectful of social distancing, and only going to the store when you need to. You know, I, I know that's for a shift for me. I love going. <laughs> I love going to all the different stores to buy a couple things at one place, a couple things at another place but really keeping the crowds uh, low inside of grocery and retail right now makes a huge difference. Um, and so, you know, just being mindful of the orders, knowing that these workers are under, under an incredible amount of stress, that it's, that it's a lift for them to go to work every day, knowing that they may get infected and may bring the illness back to their family at home. Um, so just being a good, calm patient, um, citizen during this time makes a huge different a difference. Um, thanking grocery workers for for what they're doing makes a big difference, um, and um, and tipping your um, your delivery drivers 
one thing that uh, that we've come to find through this process, especially within Instacart, um, as folks know, Instacart workers went on strike. It was a, it was a major national action. And what happens is um, sometimes people put a higher tip when they make the order, and then they're surprised to find out that the groceries don't come for two or three days. They get angry, and then they reduce their tip. So it's completely understandable that customers are upset, but to recognize that the queue is so long right now that that has nothing to do with grocery workers and um, that they you know, are working hard, they're moving as fast as they can, and they do not have the same, um, they, don't, they don't have any access to hazard pay, um, they're barely getting access to PPE as we speak. So to, you know, to not change your tip, it, 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 I, I know I'm speaking to a room of progressives and I don't think any of you would do that, but if you know about it, if you have friends, colleagues, coworkers, who are shocked about the, the slowdown and change your tip, that's a really, that's a really rough thing for uh, drivers to absorb. So I think, you know, what we are really asking for is just return to the basics. Um, what we're also advocating our community allies to do is to document. So if you go into a store and you see that workers don't have protective gear, they don't have gloves, um, you have every right as a citizen to enforce it. You have every right to ask the manager, how come the employees don't have this access? And when is it going to happen? Um, you should document it just as a good lawyer would. You'd write it down, you'd take a photo, and then send it to us. We're keeping track of this um, for our records, both to report to the company and to report to our electeds um, and to give workers the backup that they need. So, um, so always come in with protective gear. And then if you see that folks do not have it, you can take a photo. That's absolutely your constitutional right. You also have the right to ask a manager why these protocols are not in place and when they're going to occur. And then let us know and let us know exactly the location. Um, so literally like what, if you can get an exact address of your store, please include that. That's the most helpful because what we wanna do is we wanna show the geography of enforcement. And we, we need the community's help in tracking all this. It's, it's, it's completely impossible for our union to go into every single store. Um, and it's not gonna, the police are not gonna go into every store. No, we do, we do want that to happen. We're not trying to turn this into a criminal um, state, but companies need to be held to account and the only way that that's gonna happen is because of all of your eyes and ears. So that, we really appreciate that. And that can be emailed to me and I can make sure that folks have my email through this call. Thank you. And Leslie, um, Sharon? So um, I'm gonna just make one kind of big picture, uh, describe one big picture way that everybody could contribute. And then I'm gonna get a little more granular and show you our data project and tell you how we could use your help with that. I'm gonna also just say that if you have other questions that we haven't, you know, we don't get to answer today, you feel, should feel free to email me offline uh, and I'm happy to uh, answer your questions and talk to you more. Um, so the big picture thing is right now, um, public officials are very reluctant to do anything but the bare minimum in terms of releases. They're releasing the most kind of low hanging fruit populations that they perceive but get absolutely no public pushback. As I mentioned, misdemeanors, parole violators, and on the back end, uh, you know, what's happening is that parole grants are being sped up, but they're not necessarily speeding up the parole granting process. So even on the back end at that point, they're not doing a lot of releases. So if you could at any, in any way you can push your elected officials to take seriously the urgent need for decarceration and remind them about the uh, humanitarian disaster that's about to unfold in the prisons. And if you want to be strategic, you can also remind them about the instrumental uh, externality effects on the com community as a whole if we fail to decarcerate uh, because the virus is not just staying in the facilities, people are coming in and out of the facilities and when it spreads quickly inside, it also facilitates the spread outside. Um, so that's the kind of big picture thing you could do. Um, I, I'm going to show you now, um, so we started almost by accident, uh, a data project here at UCLA that has grown into this kind of um, massive team effort. And this is, I'm just, uh, um, Karen, can you see that on the screen now, the, the, data, the data sheet? Okay, 
Great. So this is the data sheet, and in the um, in the chat function, I think you see dropped in the link to the spreadsheet. And basically, what we've been doing is gathering all kinds of data related to COVID nineteen behind bars. The title page here gives you a fill, and the, the tabs are all at the bottom. But we're um, tracking confirmed cases and deaths inside. The data there is mostly from prisons, but some jails. If you come across any data, especially on the jail side. Um, if you could email me or email Grace, you see that um, her, her email is actually here on the side. Um, or we have a new uh, email address, COVID-19 behind bars at law.ucla.edu. So any data on any one of these tabs, if you have data on, please share it. We're tracking jail releases and prison releases. We're tracking and gathering all of the different population reduction requests that people have made to sheriffs, to governors, uh, to corrections officials, including through the courts. Uh, and the responses of elected officials to those requests. We also have a new tab that we just created on legal filings and court orders. Um, we have uh, volunteer uh, Yasmin Tager from uh, Oakland who's dealing with the, she's tracking youth facilities. We have a full tab now on all the changes to visitation policies in the prison system, prison conditions, fundraisers and mutual aid efforts, grassroots organizing, and then we have a really remarkable list of additional resources. Um, and all of this is taking a huge amount of work. It's now being basically operated by volunteers. Uh, we have people at UCLA and around the country who are taking responsibility for different pieces of the data and uh, filling it in. And I should say, I don't know if you noticed, but you know, we have constantly, constant traffic on the site now. Advocates are coming on and community organizers and journalists to get information. We're constantly fielding requests from journalists. Um, and we could really use your help. If you, I'm just thinking about Carlin's mission, if you are particularly, we're looking for someone to spearhead a data page on, um, we want to track COVID in immigration detention facilities, and we're just looking for people who are willing to help with that. Um, and, uh, you know, we could, we could use uh, research help on the law side because legal questions get teed up every day as a result of the um, data gathering. So, in short, any piece of this that you might be interested in working with us on, we would welcome your help on. So please reach out to me and we will put you to work. Thanks so much, Sharon. Um, so I know we only have about, I'm sorry about that noise in the background. I know we only have about 13 minutes left um, before we conclude. Um, and I just want to reiterate that we will be sending some of these next steps and contact information in a follow-up email to all attendees. Um, if you did not receive um, the initial email, um, you can also, we'll let you know how you can contact us to um, make sure that you receive the follow-up email. I want to read just a couple of questions that have come in. Um, one from Louise says, I worry that issues impacting low-income communities, especially communities of color, will be worse not only during but after the COVID-19 pandemic. Similar to how negative health outcomes have impacted disproportionately Black and Latinx communities, I think housing and economic development outcomes will also disproportionately negatively impact low-income communities of color. We saw this happen in the post-Great Recession period. Any thoughts from the advocates on how to hold and highlight the needs of precarious housing and economic situations of low-income communities and communities of color both during the COVID-19 crisis and post-COVID-19? Also, we had um, a question for Rachel that also specifically addresses um, organizing efforts around grocery workers um, that asks, how do you envision enforcement of worker protections in low-income areas of LA in a way that isn't harmful towards communities of color? Um, and um, I just wanna say that I think it is incredibly clear that um, we need to be race conscious in thinking through our solutions and our policies that, um, that yes, it is incredibly clear that um, crises always have disproportionately affected um, communities of color, um, specifically our Black, Indigenous, and Latinx communities. And um, we need to go forward in terms, of organize, in, in terms of organizing, in terms of our advocacy efforts, in terms of our policy efforts, and being race conscious in, um, in our solutions and our demands. Um, there is also a series that one of our colleagues, Kimberly Crenshaw, has put out. Um, it's a four-part series uh, called Under the Black Light that specifically is looking at um, this crisis on communities of color. And we'll send a link also to a, our podcast and the webinar series that has been um, also looking at these with an intersectional and race conscious and a critical race lens. Um, and 
I'll also ask our panelists if they would like to address that question. And I'll read the other questions also for the sake of time and maybe go around to all of our panelists. Um, we also um, have a specific question around um, if people sewing masks can also donate to the, um, to the garment worker center or just money. Do workers in food packing companies also have the right to PPE? Um, perhaps Rachel knows about this. Um, how to help farm workers who have always been essential workers, but now more than ever, we need to care for them as um, they're the backbone of our food economy. And um, I don't know if Rachel also has um, some insight into what UFW, or United Farm Workers, is also doing, because I know there are lots of initiatives there. Um, Sharon, thank you for your work on um, the Behind the Bars database. Does it or will it include um, information on federal institutions, both BOP and, and ICE? Um, and I think Sharon will also answer that. So um, Sharon, since we have you first, would you want to start, would you like to start? Sure. I mean, um, you know, I'll just echo everything Jasmine just said about um, race and um, centering uh, race when we're thinking about carceral populations who are disproportionately uh, people of color. Um, and that's something you also might remind your representatives of when you are reaching out to urge decarceration. Um, on the specific question, um, we do have tons of data on the BOP, and in fact, we're just doing numbers now. Uh, the infection rates in some BOP facilities are really quite high. Reporting is in four facilities, it's four or five percent that are reporting, and uh, we all know that those are huge undercounts. People are starting to die in a few federal facilities in particular, so if you are focusing your advocacy efforts, I hope you reach out to the BOP in particular because the um, Attorney General of the United States is being pretty minimalist in his approach to uh, decarceration on this point. Um, and the other thing, just on ICE facilities, we do have some data tracking on our uh, um, various pages that are you know, on immigration detention. But as I mentioned, we're hoping to break out a tab on immigration detention and do it more systematically. So if people are interested in working with us on that particular piece of it, I would really welcome your help. Right, maybe um, Rachel, can we hear from you next? And someone also just asked in chat, um, can you get, can they get an email for where we should send reports about lack of protect protective gear and groceries? Oh. Rachel, you're muted. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm always confused when it says mute. I think I need to unmute. Um, so yeah, so, um, Folks can email to me uh, directly um, and we can collect the information around per, uh, reports of uh, a lack of PPE. Um, I, I kind of made a list, Jesleen, of some of the comments, so I, I'll kind of work my way backwards. Um, uh, in terms of the UFW, um, I've been less involved with them, but we know that a big push on their end is to make sure that any um, undocumented worker has the same rights and protections as essential workers. That's happening right now at the state level. There's a lot of advocacy with the governor's office um, to include them in any um, benefits package that would be given to essential workers like grocery and retail. Um, so that's that I know is currently happening. Um, I wanna give a, a shout out to um, Marquise Harris Dawson, um, council member, um, in LA who, you know, was rightly, he was one of the few people who raised the, the fact when the paid sick days discussion was happening that he would not support any policy unless it included undocumented workers. And so um, that, that happened. So I think in terms of any discussion that we're having on policy, um, it has to be stated because if it's not, they will not be included in any of these policies. Um, in terms of the, the PPE, um, so yes, um, if folks have access to face coverings, um, as we know, you know, grocery and pharmacy and food delivery should not be getting a net 95 mask. They should just be getting um, face coverings. Um, companies have been very, very slow to get them out there. So if folks have easy access to them um, and they can donate, we can, we can certainly um, uh, help disperse them out. That's what we're doing every day. We, um, everybody's ordering from the same company. And so companies are, are unfortunately um, promising everybody all the things and um, saying, oh, you can get 15,000, you can get 10,000. And then they're only getting 100, you know, 200 at a time. So 
Um, if folks have access to that or they can make theirs and they want to donate, we can um, we um, can deliver those as well. Um, if folks have access to food pantries and they want to deliver food to folks in quarantine, I mean, all of the things that that you would think are needed at this time are absolutely needed. Um, in terms of the organizing that's occurring, um, you know, we've been very excited um, to see the the level of leadership in Whole Foods and Trader Joe's. Um, and this is happening, you know, this has been happening for years. This is not new organizing, but the level of anti-union um, pushback has been extraordinary. And so um, I would just say, you know, as folks do your shopping, to be mindful of the fact that there are companies that are actively trying to prevent workers from having protections. Um, and so, you know, that I think is the, you know, if folks were asking sort of, what is the world we want to come out of um, once this pandemic ends? And I think it's it's a whole readjustment of um, of access to organizing. You know, that was the the first big ask of President Obama was the Employee Free Choice Act, right? And that went down the tube very very fast. And so I would say, you know, we need a we need a whole new reckoning of labor law, and we need um, we need neutrality. Frankly, that's uh, I think that's the biggest the biggest holdup for for organizing right now. So, you know, for UFCW, that's a that's a long term plan. Um, but to recognize that a lot of leadership is occurring, I think that gives me hope that people in Amazon and Whole Foods and and Trader Joe's and Smart and Final are and Target are are really rising to the occasion, and we should we should be mindful of that. Um, and then, yeah, I would say uh, circle back to sort of the question around the low income communities and making sure that we're not turning these places into uh, over police states. We just want enforcement to occur. So it, the responsibility is always on the companies. It's not on communities to provide PPE. And it's not about throwing people out of the store if they don't have PPE on. But it is about saying that corporations have the ability if they so choose to give proper PPE to their employees. So I think that's the way we are constantly framing it. We are not in the business of making, of pushing people out of stores because they don't have PPE because that's, that's a whole other level that we're not, that's not our business. Our, our work is to, to push the corporations who are making record profit. We know that in March, Kroger who owns um, Ralph's made 30% higher um, profit than they have ever. <laughs> so, you know, there are winners and losers in this pandemic and corporations like Kroger and other grocery stores, they've hit the jackpot on this and they have access and they have the resources to provide the barest minimum of protections. And so we as consumers, we as uh, citizens can hold them to, to account. Thank you, Rachel. Um, Justin, I think we are near the end of our time together. Um, so I, I see that there's a few questions left. Um, what we will do um, is make sure the questions get passed. Uh, some of them are directed to specific speakers. Some are more general. Um, we will respond to those. And the many things we mentioned today um, and some additional things will be sent out in a recap email. So uh, we know that we went over a lot of ground. I think, like Carlin mentioned, a script for calling um, legislators. There were a number of places that um, there were some legal projects and other non-legal ways to get involved. Um, so we will send that out. Um, and so we'll be looking for an, a recap email from, from all of us. Um, and I wanted to just thank our speakers again. I know everyone is not on video and on mute, but I um, please um, thank our speakers speakers um, and acknowledge um, their, um, our gratitude for them spending time with us today and sharing their knowledge. Um, and thank you to all of you for making time to join in. If you have any follow-up questions for any of the speakers, um, I think the speakers are going to be accessible by my email. We'll send that out, but you can also direct questions to Jesseline or I or the UCLA um, co-host of this panel, and we'll make sure the right person gets the question and we'll follow up with you. Um, Jesseline, do you, you. want to say anything no. else? I was going to say, I think that in case people can stay on, I think, um, I don't know if Nisha or Carlin were able to just say their last points and if people are able to stay on. I know people do have to leave at 1.30, but if people are able to stay on just to give Nisha and Carlin just a moment to just respond to um, just that last, those last questions. Great. 
Sure. I mean, I, as Rachel was speaking, I was like, I, I would be remiss not to mention that there's plenty of opportunities for people to organize as tenants um, and uh, at the local level and, um, and, and not, not just simply in terms of, you know, organizing with respect to fighting your landlord, but also organizing um, to promote your vision of your community. Um, and there's lots of examples of that. Um, and so, I, you know, I encourage people to, to get involved and to, um, you know, with the communities and, and clients that you work with, to encourage them to get involved um, and, in order to influence local policy in that way. Um, and I'll, I'll leave the rest of the time to Carolyn. Thank you. Um, thank you to everyone for taking the time to, uh, to listen. And I would just echo that. I encourage you to get involved um, in a way that's meaningful to you during this time, because I think we are in a moment where we really can make a difference um, and we really can change the way we come out of this. So I would encourage all of you to reach out and to find ways that you can be more involved in your community at this time. Great, thank you. Sorry, I did not mean to inadvertently cut you off. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll, re we'll recap um, the next steps and send out follow-ups um, by email. And I know a few of you have commented already that you appreciated the webinar and you would like us to do more like this. So one of our questions for you um, is if there are other topics or things you'd like to see us do, we are actually looking for ideas. Um, we're kind of in a Zoom programming world for the next few months. And so we're happy to continue to do this if it's of interest to students and alumni and others in the community. So on my, on my end, I, I want to say thank you, everyone, um, to the speakers and to, to all of you for joining us. And I'll hand it back to Jasleen for, for any final words. Yeah, no, again, thank you all for your time, especially since I know you all are incredibly busy and doing really great work. So and thank you to everyone else for being here. And thank you to Karen and to everyone else, um, to Brenda, Jamie, um, and others who also helped to organize this. Okay. Goodbye.